basis ensured that every Ozark flight was on time and fully stocked to provide the very best in passenger comfort. We will see how airline travel today compares to the chef prepared full course meals that were a part of most every Ozark trip. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Jerry Castellano, editor of the Silver Swallows newsletter. Jerry, can you introduce uh, the film here? Yes. It's not like we're not used to delays. Um, thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's always fun to meet up with some of our old friends from Ozark. Uh, just a brief introduction to this uh, documentary. It started about uh, 2007. We have an annual Ozark reunion every year we have for 30 years. And uh, began to realize that you know, we were losing some people that had some unique stories to tell. And it took from that time to 2015 to put together uh, our documentary. And uh, I think that uh, you, most of us don't look at our daily jobs as being in any way historical. You know, just it's how we earn money. And uh, I came to realize from the experience of seeing people every year that are no longer with us, and uh, from also talking to younger people, like my next door neighbor who came over one day and said, you know, flying is like going to the DMV. And uh, I said, you know, it really wasn't always like that. And so hopefully that's the story that we've uh, told. So enjoy. Uh, our program today is going to be our first documentary. And after a short break, uh, we're going to come up here with some of the uh, stellar people I think that really made Ozark uh, a very unique environment, a very successful airline, a kind of an informal conversation. And it will be open to questions from any of you. And then we will show the uh, second documentary from uh, Springfield Public Television. So enjoy. Thank you. An editor of our video would like to bring also um, Steve Albert. And uh, Steve, part, the part here I have to read because I can't memorize it. Uh, and Steve was, was the uh, supervisor of commissary and cabin services. We have Cliff Day, who is our marketing representative and uh, in charter sales. And last, but certainly not least, I think the person who made this trip possible for most of us and most of our careers, uh, Mr. Salvador Cristofoli, who was our director of cabin services and uh, was in fact uh, the person that uh, really, I think, made Ozark stand out to a great degree. I was a journalism student. I was getting bored at school. It sounded like it would be a nice diversion to work as a flight attendant. It was kind of a unique thing uh, at that point, being a male flight attendant. And it uh, sounded like fun, take a break from school, and that break lasted for 25 years. And I'll let these uh, people here uh, introduce how they came into the airline business. Well, I'm not in the airline business. <laughs> small commuter airline in uh, Golden Pacific out in California and working for a travel agency uh, and uh, they weren't paying me anything but I was flying around the state of California on Beach 99s. I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, the travel agency said, well, we can't pay any money but we'll put you on the list as a travel agent so you can get these fabulous discounts. So I was flying around the world on travel agent discounts and when I was in high school on fam, travel agent fam trips to Hawaii over the weekend on Western Airlines in first class, and I said, Do they really pay you to do this kind of thing? I think the airlines sound good to me. So I couldn't fly as a pilot, glasses, with all the folks coming out of Vietnam with all these hours, so my other interest was food. So airline catering, and it was. So I went to a hotel and restaurant management school. And Ozark was the first airline. I applied to every airline in the world that had wings, and Chris was the first one to hire me, so that's how I ended up with Ozark. <laughs> I like uh, Jerry uh, was having trouble in school. They asked me to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and again, I spent 10 years in the fourth grade, so. <laughs> I got hired by Ozark uh, in um, 
the summer of 1977 in a field sales in uh, downtown Chicago. And then in the spring of 79, uh, we had just become a deregulated industry. And uh, <clears throat> the powers that be in marketing thought a good idea to spread the name around the country would be to increase charter sales, uh, particularly with ball clubs, uh, political candidates, et cetera, corporations. So uh, I was single at the time and I knew a little bit about baseball. Couldn't hit a damn curveball, but you know, whatever. So uh, <clears throat> uh, I was transferred back to St. Louis and into uh, church sales. The idea was, uh, again, to increase the uh, Ozark name throughout the country. And number two, uh, it was cash flow, which we always seem to need. Uh, in those days, you had to pay to play. And, uh, you know, kind of like Hillary Clinton. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> it was cash only uh, primarily or we didn't fly. So uh, I spent uh, until the year 2001 doing the same thing. Uh, I, I came out of the uh, uh, school uh, and went into uh, the active duty service one year, Truman. They call it Truman's year. And then you took and had six years of uh, inactive reserves. So uh, at the end of my first term, I went into, uh, uh, got my freshman year in, at uh, school. And uh, in 1950, I loved Harry Truman, but he lied to me. <laughs> I was activated with, with the Wisconsin Heavy Artillery Unit. Went back into the service again during the Korean War and uh, came out and a woman that I had dated several times before I went into uh, to, uh, active duty the second time, uh, I met her and dated her three times and then I said, this is not the woman for me. And I, when I came out, it, it, I, was, I was discharged in May, of, May 19th, 1952. And uh, we went out to the Eagles Ballroom, which is a big one in Milwaukee, and where they have uh, uh, big bands came in. And the night I was there, on the 29th, uh, was Stan Canton, who I loved dearly. He was good, good to have very, very good music, progressive jazz. And as I'm walking out, probably three seats to the wind, I heard my name, Chris, and I went over and looked at her, and I seen it was the girl I knew I should have married. And uh, she came over, and I said, you come down tomorrow, and by the end of the summer, we'll be married. We were engaged on June 11th, married on August 30th for 60 and a half years. Wow. Uh, She had to put up with me. I, I, I got into the airline by accident. When I came out of the service, I needed money. Uh, Korea was not a war, it was a police action. You went police action. So we did not get the educational benefits of World War II got. So she went through all this misery. We let two of us in a bed to get uh, a one twin bed for two of us. We were so poor. I had a teaching contract. And I said, I need money badly. I'm going to go over and try this new airline that came in, Ozark Airlines. I said, I've never heard of them. And I was hired with the intent that I'll leave at the end of the summer. And I came home and told my wife, I said, this is it now. This is my future. So I stayed with them. And within 16 months, I was being manager in Milwaukee. And in 1962, I was promoted down to St. Louis with an RMD in customer service. Uh, we started the centralized reservation offices. And in about 1964 or 65, we got a new, new president, Tom Grace. Yes. And Tom said, I want to go jets, full jets, and I want to put liquor on the flights. Get a hold of Chris Foley and have him set it up. He's got three months. Well, I don't know if you know what it takes to get an aircraft license, ram shop insurance, control, mostly of liquor, and I put the procedures out as well. So uh, I did it in three months, and then all along came the big jets, and he wanted to put food on them. So Charlie Mounts came to me and says, I want, I want you to, to work this out 
and uh, get it ready. I guess they're going to be turned over to someone else. And uh, I said, geez, I know nothing about food. I said, I know you have to eat three times a day to survive. <laughs> so I got into this thing, and I guess the good man upstairs watching over me because I came up with some very unusual services. And uh, I was very impressed with uh, Lufthansa. We had German exchange students. I, my wife and I flew over to be, spend a week with them. And all of a sudden, I was so impressed. I said, you know, why can't we do this in the States? We can modify it somewhat. And uh, a man by the name of uh, George uh, Croce was the director in inter Interline. And I said, George, what can we do? And so he got a hold of the different airlines. And uh, we started out with TAP, the airline in Portugal. And I worked with some very ex excellent chefs. This is why I think I got my, my experience. And then uh, uh, we went with Lufthansa. And then we even pushed it a little further. We had 191 flights a day that we were putting food on, coming out of 26, 28 uh, stations. And I said, why can't we bring one of their flight attendants over? So George set it all up, and now we have the International Flare Service, serving meals for Swiss Air, everyone but Italian, I'm Italian, I'm Italian. And I said, they don't put good food on their flights, so I'm not going to feature them. But uh, we, we had them all going, and, uh, and then we had the girls for Air, uh, Air Lingus, with the Greek, they all came on the first, uh, the, during, during the St. Patrick's Day, and they'd be in the parade going down to downtown. And we had, uh, I think the girl from New England, Air New England, stayed the longest. I had, I had a super back, Steve always, always a lovely Steve when he came over. But uh, all in all, that's how it got off. And then one day, I turned around and I said, I got to do something a little different. And we came up with what we call a wine cellar in the sky. Wine tasting on flights at offbeat hours, 2 o'clock in the afternoon and 7 o'clock at night. And it was, it was uh, cheaper than it was cheaper than a meal service, too. It, yeah, it was cheaper than a meal service. I know that. Uh, I guess there was a tenant that came to me one day and he says, what are you paying for that wine? And I said, well, I said, I'm paying $38 a case. He said, we've got some good wines out there. I said, that's right. He said, how come only $38 a case? I said, well, I got the idea. I went to some of the vendors and they gave me prices. I said, I can't pay that price. I said, I'm sorry. I said, I'll dump the program before I go in it. And they said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, I'm pouring your label. It's exposing your label to the passenger. Anything over thirty-eight dollars, go back to your marketing department and get them to pick it up. And they did, and that's where it, that, that was the catalyst that kicked off the oil cellar flights. But I have one incident that uh, I was coming out of Fort Myers, I think it was, and and oh, and uh, this couple got on the flight, and I was working with the flight attendant in the galley. And she said, get out of here, leave me alone, will you please? Just, just go settle down, get, don't even talk to me, just get away from me. And so uh, I said, I always stand in the back of the airplane so I could see the service I was going. And they were arguing, but we made a stop in Sarasota, and then came Sarasota nonstop St. Louis. I didn't pay too much attention, I knew they were consuming a lot of the wine too. And as, as we got off the airplane, it taxied up to the gate, and they started to get up and everything, and she turned around, she grabbed a hold of his hand, she said, come on, honey, come on, let's go. And I looked up and I said, that's one rule of me. Because he, they both were, tells you how alcohol sort of rounds off the edges. <laughs> but uh, that was it, and then uh, we had, uh, oh, we had so many different services that, that went off and the wine basket and short haul. And we did put on, I had, I think Tom, Tom Reese wanted to have breakfast to complete with the American and Delta in that Chicago St. Louis market. And uh, I came out with the wine, no, the wine service, the wine basket, and then all of a sudden I want a hot breakfast. And I looked and I said, he's got to be kidding. We, had, we didn't have the space in the galley and for, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, 
So we finally got, take, we took the big tray and cut it in half because we had the vendor make two little trays on the big one. And the only thing that was different on it was that uh, instead of fresh fruit, we put on a cup of orange juice. And we were tearing up that market. I mean, America was losing traffic, Delta was losing traffic. And I guess, I think it was Tom Grace that got the He and my also and he said, I got a call from American Airlines, I think it was Cap, Crandall, Crandall? Bob, no, and so he said to, to uh, Tom Grace, he said, uh, what are you doing to us in the Chicago market? And he said, buy a ticket to find out. <laughs> so he was, uh, this Tom Grace was a great man, we had some great leaders. And, but I think it was Tom Grace that got us going and uh, got us into the jet area. But I have to say this, we are one big happy family, we still are. Woo! So. <laughs> For those of you in the audience that uh, didn't experience this, um, the airline business was entirely different up until 1978. By law, uh, to, uh, flight between two cities, the uh, lowest price was set by law. So you couldn't compete with price, you had to have something to compete with. And uh, I think that the, uh, we did a very outstanding, we, Chris and, and, and Steve and the people in catering, did an outstanding job of coming up with some really ama imaginative and uh, sometimes very elaborate services that, that, we, uh, that we got on the airplane, like the, the wine cellar flight. And uh, that's really what established Ozark. That and it, the Ward family came up with every single person that we interviewed for the uh, documentary. We really did have, you know, no matter what the task was, as some of the stories we're gonna talk about in a minute here, uh, that required some real work on the flying by the seat of your pants, no pun intended. Um, you never ran into anyone who said, no, we really can't do that. It was more like, well, we'll find a way to get it done. And uh, to kind of extrapolate from uh, just our normal cabin services, which were excellent. Uh, Cliff and Steve can talk about, uh, we made a very, we had a very great reputation uh, in the charter world for sports teams, as you'll hear from uh, uh, political figures. Uh, they knew that Ozark could essentially, could get it done, whatever it was, so. <laughs> I, I kind of think the offshoot uh, of the customer service and the, and the terrific charter food service um, basically was because of these two guys. And they just kind of doubled down when the charters came about and we developed a reputation, uh, particularly with the ball clubs, that we were, I mean, we were the gold standard by far. And along with the flight crews that had to serve it, it was one of our best sitting right there. And, uh, some of the things that they had to do uh, in a short amount of time was on a charter was rather incredible. Uh, <clears throat> There's one particular story I'm going to tell, and I'm going to try to make it short, but since we're in the middle of a political season, uh, so to speak, uh, <clears throat> this one might be kind of relevant. Ozark first put its toes in the water uh, with politics with some uh, guy named Ted Kennedy in the area. Yeah. And uh, we did a few trips with them in 1980, and then something happened that was called Chap Quiddick, you know, I know what it is. And uh, so long story short, the money dried up. And uh, so we didn't get paid, and the Kennedy uh, people had said, oh, don't worry, we're with Louis Kennedy, so, you know, our money's good. Well, uh, after that thing hit the fan, no more money. So the work came down, if you ever do this again, uh, it's wire transfer, no full around. So fast forward to 1984, and uh, we pick up Senator Gary Hart uh, out, of, out of Colorado, and we flew them <clears throat> probably, what would you guess, Steve, 10 times maybe? Somewhere around there. And then he started to uh, nosedive in the polls. And this was long before Donna Rice and Monkey Business. That hadn't even hit, hit the fan yet. But he wasn't doing well in the polls, so suddenly they go back to Air Bozo. And uh, I think it was an old uh, Ports of Call Convair 880 out of Cincinnati. 
still had turbojet motors on it. Chief flight attendant was some young lady named Edna, who they, the press said was about 90. <coughs> so they referred to this Convair as Air Edna. And she was all by the book. Well, the press, or the zoo part of the airplane, wasn't in anything by the book. So, anyway, long story short, they're on uh, Air Edna and they're in Philadelphia. And I'm sitting in the office, phone rings, hi, it's the heart campaign, we've got a problem. I'm thinking, yeah, you're down the poles, you bet your butt you got a problem, whatever. <laughs> they said, no, we need to be in San Diego. And I said, that's well. I said, when? They said, oh, this afternoon. <laughs> so I'm thinking, all right, well. And this, this uh, I digress for just a moment. This goes back to the family issue that Ozark truly was because the amount of phone calls that had to be made and how many different departments had to be involved to pull this together in about 40 minutes was pretty incredible. So anyway, the phone's ringing out and talking to this guy. He said, yeah, we, we need to get there. He's got a speech in San Diego tonight. And it's 11 o'clock in Philadelphia, and a.m. is I don't know what time. So <clears throat> I looked at my trusty timetable that's right, no computers in those days. And saw that we had a commercial, 770, I think it was. 777. 777. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Air Edna blew up in Philadelphia. One of the engines blew up on rotation, so they're stranded. So uh, I look at the timetable and, aha, 770's getting ready to push to St. Louis. Call the counter in Philadelphia and got a hold of uh, Jay, Jay Woods. So what story on 77? 770, how many people on it? He says, 19. So where is it? He said, we said, just pushed back. He said, get it back to the gate. No problem. So he has it pulled back to the gate. Next call, dispatch, Charlie Hongman. Greatest dispatcher, charter guy that ever lived. Clifford, what are you up to now? <laughs> Well, I'm going to need a four tank DC 9 with dash 9 power. Where are we going? San Diego. When? Two hours. Okay, there's one coming out of me. Done. Next call. The genius, right here. Big boy. Uh, we're taking heart to San Diego. And he's going, huh? Where? When? I said, St. Louis to San Diego. You got an hour and a half to put food together. Take it from there when you're in it. Well, called O'Hare Flight Kitchens, which was a whole other story. Uh, the big boys used to use the Dobbs and the Marriott, so Chris came up with the idea of mm -hmm. using the small guys because we were important to them, to a Marriott or a Dobbs. It's, oh, sorry, okay, we'll get to you when we can get to you. We got the big boys to take care of. So Chris worked with a, a VP that retired from Dobbs, and they started this small company called Ozark, uh, called O'Hare Flight Kitchens, who catered only to Ozark in Sioux City. Denver, Dallas, St. Louis, Chicago, wherever we needed a caterer, we would go in and set up a caterer. At any rate, so called over to Stephanie, who was the buyer, and said, well, we got an issue here. We need a, it's much, we need about 80 meals to go to San Diego in an hour and a half. What do we have? And no other charters that day, so it wasn't exactly the charter food. So we started going through the coolers, we had some flare meals, some dessert cart services, and we just cobbled together a wine cellar, and we cobbled together what we could and figured out where we could pack it. And so yeah, I, I called the commissary and had them put on 51 liquor kits and 30 cases of beer. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Stephen, O'Hare Fly Kitchens pulled this together. And uh, my next call was crew scheduling, saying, all right, I'm gonna need four flight attendants that have been Secret Service checked already. Because Secret Service, background checks, et cetera, as well as cockpit. So crew scheduling said, jumped in and started doing their thing. And then it was time to call the ramp tower in St. Louis saying, all right, 770 is inbound from Philadelphia. It's got the heart campaign on it. Put them on J1. And these were the docks prior to the building of the East Terminal. It was on the east end of Bangor at the time. And, I, and then I said, yeah, we're going to tow up a <clears throat> maintenance DC-9, put it on J-2, and we're going to run the campaign from J-1 to J-2. We're off to San Diego. Uh, go ahead. So, I mean, 
Airport never saw it, no passengers, landed, pulled right into J1, campaign gets off, makes a new turn right on the J2, and off they go. We laid it down, and uh, it was, again, it was, you think about all these departments that were working together in that short amount of time to pull this off. Later on, I think we made the cover of time because of that kind of thing. Uh, later, we also learned that the, uh, the Senator Martin uh, got up and graciously thanked all the passengers uh, on that commercial flight out of Philadelphia, and he bought drinks. Well, he bought drinks for all the women. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, and then the next day we went on to San Diego, and that was probably set a record for the shortest flight that ever received in-flight meal service. Meal service. San Diego, no, San Diego or Burbank. I don't even think they put the, the gear up. It was the last trip we thought we were, we were going to have with them because, again, they were running out of money, so they needed us for that leg. We figured, all right, we're going to go out, we're going to go out in style because the video police, which was the group in the back of the press, loved us, so they were making it hard for the heart campaign not to fly us. When they came into St. Louis from Philly, they were going to Cliffy. Hey, Cliffy, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, those days, again, the, uh, the, uh, the, that was the Washington Press Corps. And uh, they were uh, a different sort back then, as you can imagine. They invented a, a little deal called sky surfing. And uh, <clears throat> they would sit on the emergency stand on I mean, the emergency placard in the seat. They'd pull them out and stand on them as the airplane was rotating up like this, facing aft. And the idea was to see how fast you could surf to the back of the airplane while they had a cigarette in their mouth. Now, we're just taking off, right? They just hoped they didn't spill their beer. That was, that was you can't tell that to the safety guy I'm sorry, the safety guy. Yeah, safety guy. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. No, no, there's, there's, a, there's a statute of limitations, so <laughs> you're free to disclose anything at this My point. My parole officer is right outside, so what you do. Jerry, can I just inter inject this here? I never lost sight, and I made sure that my staff never lost sight, that the most important thing on an aircraft was the pilot, of course, but flight, the 1,000 flight attendants we had. And they always keep saying, Chris, you did a good job. No, I, I'll still say to this day, you did the job. If I asked for a pot of coffee being uh, brewed before a breakfast flight to set up the atmosphere, for the food, they did it. And I, I have just one, one, one thing here. Uh, every time we tried something new, we went to Peg Moore and said, Peg, let's try it on the flight. Let's take, pick up a segment, try it. And uh, it was a wine cellar between St. Louis and Dallas for one month. And then at the end of the month, we all meet the flight attendants that had that block and, and so on in Peg's office. And I went into the, into the room, Peg was there, and I'm not going to be mentioning any names, but there's the four flight attendants. And uh, the one came up that was quite unionized and said, Chris, it's a stinking service. It's hard to do. It consumes a lot of time. And I said, here we go, file 13 on that one. And she looked up at me and she said, but Chris, the passengers liked it. Let's go. I got to thank all, every one of you. You did a damn good job for us. So be, be prepped, full of pride. I think everybody signed off and sent that memo out. I said, I hope you brush off with some of the TWA's flight, flight crews because their service was just lousy. <laughs> so thank you to all the flight attendants that are here. And certainly for those of us in the airline business realize that every airline had a very unique identity. And as I just said earlier, we were the airline that we were a family. We could criticize our own fellow employees, but God help if anyone outside the family criticized anyone. And 
we, we got things done and we cooperated. And I think one of the more important parts is everyone really cared. We realized how much work it was for these kind of services to be developed, to be implemented. And when someone is giving you something like that to work with, it inspires you. And I think no matter what, we, that, I think that from the person who cleaned the aircraft to the people that maintain the aircraft to all of our customer service frontline people, I think that was a hallmark of those are airlines. And that's one of the things that I think, unfortunately, uh, we don't see a lot of these days. But to add to that, again, the wine cellar, particularly on the Dallas flight, was one of the tougher, tougher services. It's a short flight, hour and 18 minutes or less at that time, depending upon the winds. And the official procedures were always written, which got tossed out the window because then the flight attendants would get a hold of it and figure out how to really make it work. And one of the things they figured out then was, all right, well, well we've got all these kit bottles of wine, we'll open those on the ground and stick them back in so that we don't have to start on that after takeoff. Of course, Chris was not like that because once the corks were open, they couldn't be reused. But expediency went out, and that's what used to happen. Corks would be open, and they'd be back into their kits for takeoff, and it just sped up the service that much. There was never much left. <laughs> There was a, uh, one other, uh, I'll be brief here, Jerry, there, there was a, another uh, trip, this was for uh, Congresswoman Geraldine Ferraro, and uh, we were heading into uh, the March primary season, I do believe, and uh, this, this is a weather-related story, and we were coming out of the Pacific Northwest, I think it was Portland, and or Seattle, was it? And we, we were scheduled to go to Pittsburgh, which was pretty long haul on a DC-9, but uh, we were scheduled to run nonstop. And suddenly, before we leave, the campaign go, you know, ringy dingy dingy, Cliffy, this is the campaign guru. We need to go to Columbia because the poll, meaning Missouri, because the polls are tightening in Missouri. So we need to go there first. Then we're going to Pittsburgh. Okie dokie. Next call. Captain and dispatch, and then Steve saying, Call the airport restaurant. I guess they're making cheeseburgers. <laughs> so, in any case, uh, we take off, and uh, as we're getting close to Columbia, uh, things are getting kind of dicey. I mean, I, you know, I'm up on, on the jump seat, and uh, we're starting to see uh, all kinds of things get painted green all over the radar, and those days it wasn't color. And uh, so we landed in Columbia, and the tower's getting real nervous. And I had a real senior captain by the name of Bob Harrison. And a guy, a first officer, on his first trip. And this kid was so young and new, his damn hat didn't fit. And the bill was here. You could never see the guy's damn eyes. It's like, oh, yeah. Harrison's like, okay, this is going to be swell. In any case, uh, we started getting all these, you know, National Weather Service dire warnings. Um, and, you know, Tornado Watch went into tornado warnings, and the sky is doing the Dorothy from Kansas crap, you know. Tower says, we're getting the hell out of here. And Big Bob Harrison goes, no, you're not, because we got to get out of here. And the, uh, the video, all the uh, media guys in the back of the plane, are all suddenly they're all very quiet. And imagine this, they were fastening their seatbelts. They were like, hmm, this could be interesting. So, uh, Tower clears us to go get Columbia Regional, and they get the hell out, they evacuate. So we taxi out to the end of the runway, and Bob Harrison turns this damn DC-9 into 360, but the radar pointed straight up. And I'm thinking, what the hell is going on here? And he goes, I know where I'm going. Called the tower back, I guess one soul remained, said, give me, give me this heading, and we're going to Pittsburgh. You could have heard a pin drop where all the animals were in the back of the airplane. I mean, these guys were not saying a word. So we take, they clear us to go, we take off, not a ripple, not even a bump. And all these, all these uh, press guys in the back of the airplane just lose it. They're all cheering, they're chanting, Ozark, Ozark, Ozark. Anyway, which is kind of a fun story, but I'm not really damned because she lost too, so you know. <laughs>
here it had one, one uh, printer. That's how I knew it was Seattle. I got a call from United and they said, uh, would you mind if we put our chef on board? On, uh, yeah, Ferraro. And uh, I said, uh, no, God, I'm not paying no, any overtime. He said, no, no, it's, it, we got to get him back to, to Chicago, and he can take your flight into Columbia, and then wherever, and then he got a ticket back to uh, United in Chicago, because that was our corporate. And then when he got there, he gave me a call when he got back to his base. And he said, you know, Chris, he said, I don't know if she'll make a good VP. And I said, well, what, what made you say that? He said, I was on board and getting ready to serve her. And she was crying and crying and crying. And I, I tried to talk to her and he said she wouldn't, you know, wouldn't respond. Evidently, the press or the, someone had gotten a hold of the <coughs> and they were investigating her mother and father and she wasn't taking it too well. And he said, he said I was just wondering well, how she would react if a crisis hit us and, and she was VP. So that's why I knew she came out of Seattle. Well, and then what that crisis turned out to be was some of the press people had determined that her husband uh, was considered to be at the time a bit of a slumlord uh, in the New York City area. Now, whether how much of that was true or not, I, I don't really know, but I, I recall that. And she was very, very upset. And I think probably with good reason. I think that and her parents say, yeah. you know, uh, it, I don't know why, I can't even stand watching TV today because it's, everything is negative. And uh, negative back. And you can get a lot more when you make someone laugh. And, and, and that's why I, I always try to sit there and, and compliment the flight attendants uh, all the time because, you know, it, it, it doesn't do any good to be negative something. And if they know, I, I, I was criticized. I was brought up before my VP and he said, Chris, you're creating a problem for some of these directors. And I said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, you can't everyone call you Chris. And I said, that's right. I said, that's, I do this for a purpose. And he said, what's the purpose? I said, if they had to call me Mr. I said, I already built the wall there. I said, by being Chris, I'm one of them, and they can solve a lot of problems for us because they're in the trenches, and that's that's how I got to go. I, the army gave me the name Chris, and then it was always Chris with everyone else. Even the vendors used to say that, uh, that uh, oh, I knew Mr. Christopher Foley. I'm going to see him. He said, "You knew who?" He said, "Mr. Christopher Foley." He said, "No, no, no. His name is Chris. Just call him Chris." But you know, that's, that's the philosophy. Yeah, that no matter what level we are, what we had to do in our, our responsibilities, it's always good to, to sit there and talk to people on their level because you learn something every time they speak. That's what people go to two years of, uh, to get a master's in business administration to uh, learn what Chris just talked about. You know, they always, now, nowadays the buzz phrase is to uh, bring the level of decision down to the person who actually has to do the job. And uh, as a flight attendant, Chris's office direct number was in our manuals. If we had a problem with something somewhere, we were supposed to call Chris's office. If it was business hours, we'd get a hold of him, or we would uh, leave a message. And that's exactly how things got done. The next morning, I'd be on an airplane to the city or wherever it was. I don't know what the heck was going on. <laughs> because I enjoyed my family and I wanted to be home as much as possible, I fly out to San Diego and check the kitchen and I could fly back in one day and by the time I get landed in St. Louis, I felt my eyes five inches out of my head because I was seven and a half hours in the air and trying to get, get back home again. And, uh, and of course, Stephen was my wife uh, she always gives Stephen the best of everything, you know. And my daughters adopted him as a brother. And my wife said one day, she said, she said, well, he's like a son to us. And I looked and I said, please, no, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but we always had a lot of humor, and Steve was always there, and with the family, still is. And uh, of course, my wife passed away three and a half years ago, and they lost a daughter in February this year. 
And he's always there calling me and saying, how you doing? And, and, uh, and so on. And I think that's what everyone does. That was what those are. They always want to know how the other person is doing. And uh, you can bank on us anytime. And so we are family. If you remember long ago, and you bought a Cardinals ticket, uh, on the back was an advertisement because those are airlines, was the official airlines of the St. Louis Cardinals. And that was not the only major sports team and college sports team that we carry. And uh, my favorite story that I will ask Steve to tell is the uh, weekend charter to Charleston. The wrong Charleston. Was it Charleston? What no? The sports charter. You took off to the wrong destination. Oh, well, that was more than one of those. <laughs> farm teams, and uh, the traveling secretary turned to the charter up a different one than the clip and said, uh, so you guys want to come to the game? Just so fly in and play the game and then go on to the next uh, station back to play the majors. I think it was Pittsburgh or something. And uh, Max said, no, uh, we're not going to go to the game. Uh, we're going to the beach instead. And <laughs> Whoops. the traveling secretary kind of looks at him and gets this curious look on his face and says, to the beach? Yeah. Paul got interrupt one second. You remember the traveling secretary for the Astros? Mm. Donald Davidson. He's <laughs> three feet two. And I remember it was about that tall. And his business cards were that big. And he'd wear this 10 gallon cowboy hat and he could cuss like. <laughs> so anyway, uh, he says, well, that's a couple hours away. How are you going to get over there and get back? And Matt gets this kind of concerned look on his face and says, what do you mean? He says, Charleston's in the middle of the mountains. And Matt goes, Charleston where? Charleston West. Charleston, West Virginia. And we were a flight plan to go to Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> so in midair, there comes a little left bank. <laughs> and uh, we land in Charleston, West Virginia. And I go to the airport caterer, who was, who was just closing. It was a Saturday afternoon. And I said, wait a second. Uh, you guys busy? So no, we're closed. We're going home for the weekend. So, no, you're not. <laughs> How would you like to cater an airplane for the Houston Astros? Again, all right, let's open the coolers, see what we have, let's see what we can put together. Yeah, that was, um, there was another Charleston, West Virginia one with uh, going into Huntington, West Virginia, that little airport. United had been in there, so we had to go into it. It was a foggy day. It's Gary Hart again. <laughs> See, what, what, what charter was it that went down to Mexico City and they had a mechanical and they got it repaired, repaired and it was, they had a noise abatement. No one flight to take off after, after midnight. And so what happened, the captain locked it all up and started taxiing out. They told him to come down back. He couldn't take off. This is a story I heard. I'm not too sure how much it was true. And they said, uh, uh, the tower said, you'll have to come back. And the Mexican trip was in front of him, ready, ready for takeoff. And he said, follow me. And they, they, they actually were supposed to have flown from Mexico City to Houston and all that, until they got over to the American territory from the blinking lights, the flash of red lights, and they followed Mexicana uh, into that, uh, into that, to Houston. So that, it, it's, it's, I'll tell you, we had fun. I think that's the nice thing about this all. We all had fun. I, I can vouch for that. I was on. Oh, yeah? yeah. And then there was another trip into Mexico. And if we're getting low on time, it's, it's okay. done. We're fine. Okay. We're good. Uh, we're good. Uh, we're in Ixtapa, which is the airport, uh, well, it's a lot in England, it works out. And it was a brand new airport, and it was a really nice facility, but it was very small. And this was one of our first forays into Mexico. And we had signed a large tour uh, package with a company called Adventure Tours out of Dallas. Anyway, this was one of the first, this was the first trip from St. Louis down to uh, Zlatnail when we were to fly empty back to St. Louis. So we land, Pete and Q's the captain. We're taxiing into the gate, we're just kind of carrying on talking about 
worked out, nothing good. And there's a Pan Am 707 sitting on the tarmac with one of its uh, callings up. <clears throat> and we get into the little gate uh, operations area, I'm paying the fuel bill, and Pete's uh, getting his dispatch paperwork, and whatever, what have you. Suddenly these people in the gate start going, Ozark, 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 what are you doing down here? Help us, help us, help us. Well, as it turns out, the Pan Am 707's got a mechanic. But anyway, this Pan Am captain with his British lilt accent and the white hat and the word Pan Am says something to, to the queue about, what the hell's little bitty Ozark doing down here, mate? Something like that. The queue says, hey, bonehead. At least my, my DC-9 starts. <laughs> Long story short, uh, these, these uh, folks in the gate were St. Louis's. So I made a call to dispatch, called my boss, what do you think? Looked at Petey, he's going, what the hell am I? I ran over to the Pan Am 707 and their flight attendants were great. They said, take whatever you need, Cokes, Pepsi's, booze, and I mean, I'm taking all the booze. Hell, they're like saving us enough for the beach party since we're suddenly not going home tonight and not flying. So anyway, we loaded up and off and sing those good morning. You know, I, I used to love to come in on Monday and I hated to see a Friday come because we always had so much fun. And this <coughs> kid here over here, see this, Stephen, he could upset anyone and he, he had something going with my secretary, I have no idea. But she would say Stephen, and poor Stephen would, I do, I do, I go ahead to go out there and, and bring peace between the two. Oh, we had, we had the Brickhoff twins. I, I don't know if you ever remember them, they're from Germany. They spoke uh, German fluently and very keen with the American language. But anyways, one was flying a DC-3 on one trip, and the other was flying a DC-3 on the other trip. And they both came together at Cedar Rapids. And they held the one flight for a passenger coming off to get on to the one other flight to continue. And this pastor picked up his coat, his coat hat and everything and ran like a son of a gun for the other airplane, crawled up the airplane and looked at him and said, how the hell did you get here before I did? <laughs> but uh, they, we, they, we always had, uh, we always had uh, a lot going and, I, I relive that same thing all over again. It's been a good life. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. You, sir. I'd like to hear if anybody has any experience of 9-11 when we had 5,000 craft in the air and they had to land with it. If there's anybody here that can talk about that, we'd like to hear the experience there. Just, I, I remember driving to uh, the OGO headquarters that day and they had the TV on and uh, a few days later, it was when they, uh, during the grounding, it was just such an eerie feeling not hearing any jets in the, in the sky at all. That, that's all I think. I was working at that time for uh, Transworld Airlines in the, uh, in the safety department as an instructor. And um, I remember I was teaching that morning and on breaks come in and you'd hear things bit by bit. And uh, we had, we called it the war room, it was a conference room. And they monitored all the flights. And I knew, in fact, some of my friends who were crew members at the time uh, were diverted, in many cases, not knowing the reason why. You know, some of the lucky people were able to tell air traffic control that they were, say, 20 minutes out of St. Louis, you know, instead of going to Champaign, Urbana, we can get on the ground just as quickly and get to our destination. But a lot of people wound up for days and, uh, more or less, I, I, probably grind, grounding the aircraft was the easy part. In fact, you can see, I think, on YouTube or online, a video of, it looks like several funnels where the dots all just go around and disappear. Uh, but the big logistical problem was, you know, our crew members just yeah. rented cars. They got home. We had airplanes in one place. We had crew members, God knows where they were, because they were no longer, you know, I think start the whole thing back up was probably a lot more problematic. We, we were told in flight to go to the nearest suitable airport. If you told them a pair of airport you wanted to go to, they'd clear you there. We talked to them later. All they wanted to know was, are you in command of your flight? 
Thank you. Someone else? Yes. Just a sidebar comment I wanted to throw in here from a guy who's uh, not an Ozark person, but an aviation historian. I've been following Ozark ever since I came to St. Louis in 1968, way back then. And that is that something that comes through loud and clear to me from all of you guys up here, sorry that you're hearing, is that one of the essential ingredients of the Ozark success is what I call a can do attitude. I think that's very true, and I think, uh, as you can also hear from these stories, uh, standardization was not our strong suit. And as I like to say, when I look at a lot of our coworkers and reunions, I look around at myself as well, and I think, you know, if they had psychological testing back in the day, a lot of us probably would have gone down. Another question back there, yes. Absolutely. Uh, a while back, uh, Jerry and I have worked together on some projects before, and uh, I was looking kind of for my next project to do, and Jerry had approached me with the idea about Ozark Airlines, and I was familiar with Ozark Airlines. I had the pleasure of being a Cub Scout and getting my junior pilot's license. I believe it was in DC-3. Uh, it scared the hell out of me. I don't think I flew for about 10 more years after that. But. Uh, Jerry approached me about it, and I was definitely intrigued. You know, I come from a generation that's, I would call it the flip-flop sweatpants kind of flying experience. It's, you know, it's just more or less about getting to your destination. And I started looking through some of the pictures, and I was just so amazed. I mean, you can't hardly get people to put socks on now, but there was these people in three-piece suits and, and dresses. and. You know, it seemed to me that it, the journey was almost as fun as the destination. So I was just really intrigued by that. And, you know, working with Jerry and, and interviewing these great guys, you know, I, I learned how much the company actually meant to the city of St. Louis. You know, that's a rarity nowadays. So, you know, just, just being able to, to learn all about the way things wore and how it has changed, it was just so intriguing to me. And, and, you know, Jerry kind of guided me through the process. He was my historian and, and made sure we were showing the right planes when, when we talked about them in the documentary. So it, it was just a great experience to see how this airline has, you know, touched all of you and, you know, especially the city of St. Louis, too. So I hope I did you all justice. As I said, you don't think of your job, even at this late a date, almost 40 years after I started. I went on my very first, uh, my only interview with Ozark Airlines exactly 39 years ago yesterday, uh, and uh, started in early 1978. And still, when we're among each other, it doesn't seem very remarkable, and it takes the perspective of someone from the outside to look at it and think, this is almost like science fiction. People are actually, you know, dining off of China and having cocktails and reading big hardback books. And um, it was a different era. And I think that's one of the more important aspects is to have someone like Jim who can, who can contrast it. And uh, it almost makes it easier to tell us. It, it does make it easier to tell the story. I, I make it a point to dress nice when I fly now. So, I remember some stories. Yes. Flight attendants can back me up on this. When you're a new hire, they used to often play practical jokes on you. And uh, I remember a particular story. I wasn't around, but it was one of our senior captains, and there was a, who is now a very senior flight attendant, but it was her first uh, trip on a DC 3. And in those days, you had to serve every leg, at least beverages. This was before the food service, but on the DC-3, they served beverages every leg, didn't matter how long or how short it was. And this particular uh, leg was uh, Decatur Champagne, which is just really, just literally a, a pop pop. And so on takeoff, the captain calls the flight attendant to come forward and says, no, don't alarm the passengers but we have a fire on the left engine. I want you to go back and bring me a cup of water. 
So he went back down to the water, brought it forward, he opens the sliding window because he can't get this far off the ground, throws it out, looks back there and says, didn't go out, go get me another one. <laughs> so the you know, length of this 10 minute flight, this flight attendant's running back and forth and the cabin a cup of water, a water. And I'm sure the passengers are going, my goodness, that's a thirsty cup. Who the heck is here? So just on the final approach, he says, okay, go back, take your it's out, we're fine, don't worry about it, go back, take your seat. And they went on through the rest of the day, and the hops, and then they're having dinner somewhere that night, and the captain turns to find and said, you know, I just want to tell you, you did a beautiful job of that incident we had today. Um, quite proud of you, and uh, you're going to be a great flight at dinner. She said, well, I was really kind of concerned about that. He said, well, what's that? Said, well, we have to serve our passengers in every leg, and I wasn't able to serve our passengers on that leg. He said, oh, don't worry about that. Anybody says anything to you, I'll, 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 I'll take care of it. Said, oh, I'm not worried about it. I wrote up a report three stops ago and sent it in. <laughs> 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 you have a question? Well, I'm planning to have a comment. Yeah. My dad was a um, maintenance supervisor, second shift, and um, he worked uh, well, he worked second shift, so we didn't get to see him um, as kids growing up all week. We'd live for the weekend when we could see Dad, because he was, you know, working nights. And um, I, I just wanted to kind of, I, re I remember his boss was Meese. I don't remember his first name. What's his first Ed name? Ed Meese. And I remember when the phone would ring at our house, and it was, it was Mr. Meese. A hand went up, and everybody in the house knew not to say a word because he had to listen to what was going on because he usually was being called into work or he was being called to go to another city to change an engine. You know, there were a lot of times when Dad had to fly all over the country to go help, uh, you know, with engine changes. I remember what you were talking about with clothing. When we, you know, Ozark afforded our family the opportunity to take trips. We didn't have a lot of money, but we could go for a day or two because... We can fly cheaply, and we had to wear our very, very best clothes on those trips, to go on those trips. And, you know, Ozark was a, a, a great place for my dad to work. He was there from the first month they started until TWA bought him and uh, retired only because he had to, because there was no place he loved more than being with those airplanes and you people and doing what he did. Uh, with the uh, flight attendants, there's so many stories going around when we're flying to DC-3s, and uh, one of them was, um, uh, I, I guess in my 80s, it takes a while before something is registered when it comes to names, but there was a captain and first officer, and it was a DC-3, and they were loaded here in St. Louis, and the cargo bin was right, right in the rear portion of the aircraft. And uh, they kept, they're they getting ready to go, and the uh, captain said, where's my first officer? And they said, well, uh, isn't he up there? And he said, no, I haven't got anyone up there. And he said, uh, uh, well, you're going to have to go. And he said, well, I'll, he said, fine, just button it up, we're going to go. Well, in the meantime, as soon as that, that the stairs are pulled up and locked, first officer came around and shoved him in the cargo bed with his coat and everything else. And it was going from St. Louis to Springfield. So when it got off in Springfield, of course, the captain called ahead of time and said, take him out of the, out of the uh, ca ca cargo bin. And they had it set up. So he'd be on the other side of the aircraft when they're unloading the passengers. And then all of a sudden, when the plane was empty, the guy was running around, white scarf, long coat, and carrying his uh, flight kit bag, and going, to, wow, I didn't think I was ever going to catch up with you. <laughs> and, and I have a pistol story for you because you were you were you were fresh meat at the time when I say you know that you you, you believed anything that they said God did. And there's so many stories that, that's what I'm saying, stories like that would make a, a bestseller. And then there was another one where uh, I think it was Mrs. Mounts was the uh, one of our VPs. 